here with us and uh, Holy Spirit just help us today. Um, there is no doubt this is a new year and God is doing new and greater things and God wants you and I to do exploits. The whole world, the whole world is waiting for us as children and sons of God to manifest. You know, we received a very strong word and as a theme for the month of February, which we are following, which is little foxes that spoil the vine. And we've been talking about um, the little things that destroy kings. Last week, we looked at little things that destroy priests. And today, we'll just go on to what we will title a king and the little foxes. A king and the little foxes. Uh, last week we looked at the priests and uh, there is a link somehow between what we want to look at today and what we looked at last week. We looked at the prophets, uh, sorry, the, the priests last week and uh, I hope we remember three things we looked at that destroys priests. I hope you are not a forgetful hearer. So what's the first thing we looked at last week? Lack of knowledge. And then number two, little eyes. What you see. Priests, if they don't see very well, they can be misled and mislead others. And number three, little children. We see how the sons of two priests in the Bible, Eli and Samuel, how their, uh, their, their sons, they had grown up. But the tragic thing is that they grew up, the sons grew up in the house of, in the home of a priest. And uh, they turned, you know, after wicked ways. And, you know, God just help us that we take note of these things. Now, do we know, according to First Samuel chapter 8, uh, from verse 1 to 7, it was because of the little children who have become sons of, of priests that the people of Israel began to demand and request for a king. It was because the priest, the priest's children, so to speak, misbehaved. Let's go to First Samuel and let, let us just see it quickly. In First Samuel, um, chapter eight. Uh, let me just get us the exact scripture. Because we stopped with the little children of priests last week. So if we look at First Samuel and uh, chapter 8, because just to see the link between what we want to look at today, because we are doing a case study on, of the first king in the Bible, the very, very first king. In verse, okay, let's read from verse 1. The Bible says it came to pass when Samuel, who is the priest, and the prophet was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second Abia, they were judges in Beersheba. His sons, verse 3, they did not walk in his ways, but turned after lucre, took bribes, perverted judgment. Look at what happened as a result of that. From verse 4, and all the elders of Israel they assembled and came to Samuel. Samuel is the priest here at Ramah. And hear what they said in verse 5. They said to him, Behold, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint us a king to rule over us like all the other nations. And verse 6, it, But it displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. What was their reason for requesting for a king? The sons of priests misbehaved. So we want to do a case study of the first king in the Bible and the foxes that destroyed him. So let's turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 9. What we'll just do today is run a quick commentary so that we can... Um, just cover all the things, the highlights of what the Spirit of God, I believe, wants to let us see about this first king. This first king 
was known as Saul. We see that in 1 Samuel and chapter 9. Now, in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 9, the Bible says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zero, the son of Bekorat, the son of Aphir. He must have been a Ghanaian. <laughs> a Benjamite, a mighty man of wealth and valor. Verse 2. Kish had a son named Saul. A choice young man and handsome. Among all the Israelites, there was not a man more handsome than he. He was a head taller than any of the people. The King James said he was head and shoulders above everyone. Now, let's look at this Saul. If you read the whole of 1 Samuel chapter 9 and uh, you know, read from chapter 9 to chapter 16, that's the commentary and the points and the highlights we want to look at. So let's look at Saul's background. You just follow this story. You know, that first chapter, chapter 9, tells us a lot of things about Saul. Let's look at his background. The first king in the Bible. The very first king. Verse 2 tells us he was handsome. Very good looking. He was a choice young man. He was very tall. Verse 5 tells us something. He was such a considerate young man. Very thoughtful of his father. You know what happened? One day, uh, his father's um, donkeys got missing and he went looking for the donkeys and they couldn't find the donkeys. And, you know, time had gone and he told the servant, look, my father at this time will be getting worried. That shows you the kind of mentality he has on his head. It's not a young man who will just go out and would not care what his father thinks. Consider it thoughtful. And in verse 6, the servant advised him that, okay, you know what, let's go into this town and see a prophet. So we see something about him there. He had a servant, but he listened to his servant. That should tell us something about his background. He's a humble, it takes a humble man to listen to his servant. You know, servants are meant to be sent on errands. They are meant to serve. But it takes someone who's humble to listen to his servant. So we see that background about this young man, handsome man called Saul. And verse 6 tells us that he said, well, after the servant advised him, let's go and see this, um, this uh, prophet in this town, this seer. He tells the servant, no, let, let's not go there empty-handed. Let's look for something to give, you know, this man of God. So we see another background to him. He's someone who has respect and regard for men of God. You know, not many young men, especially when they are handsome, have respect for men of God. You know, when a man is handsome, he can use his looks as a charm. So you don't need to listen to anybody. You can charm anybody, you know, with your good looks. Not, not so. Not so. Verse 21 tells us something. When he was being hinted, just go to verse 21. Please just follow me with the scriptures I'm giving you, right, so that people can focus on the scriptures. When he was kind of hinted, he will be a king. Hear what he said. Am I not a Benjamite? Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Is not my family the least of all the families of the clans of Benjamin? Why then do you speak this way to me? That should tell you something about this guy. Very humble. He looked at himself. No, I'm, 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 I'm least. I don't deserve any honor whatsoever. You know, that's his background. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Because even when it was clear now they were going to make him a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 10 from verse 20 to 27, we saw that the day of his coronation, he went to hide. He ran away. He, doesn't want, he didn't want to be king. You know, he's not some ambitious guy who is looking for position. He wasn't looking for position. He wasn't looking for um, authority. Very, very humble. Look at the beginning of this king. And after they had to fish him out from the stuff, the Bible said he was, they found him, he was hidden the stuff, whatever the stuff meant. 
you know, but they got him out of the stuff. And uh, from verse 6 to 7, we see how the Spirit of God begins to use him. The Spirit of God began to use this humble young man, good looking. Only God knows how many six feet or seven feet tall he was, but we knew he was taller than everybody. So, you know, that tells you he was kind of very conspicuous but humble. You know, the kind of person who doesn't, even though he knows he's conspicuous, but he doesn't want to be seen. Spirit of God begins to use him. Please stick to the scriptures. Put the scriptures on the screen. First Samuel chapter 10. Uh, sorry, verse 11 from verse 6. The Spirit of God begins to use him. He delivers the people of God. You can bring the slides on later and uh, you know we can write that down. And uh, he begins to rule with authority. The Bible tells us in verse 7 of 1 Samuel chapter 11. You know, this is someone who began to really rule with the authority of a king. And, you know, the things he did made people to fear God. Look at what he did. He took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces. When some people came and said they were going to fight, you know, his people, he sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying that whoever does not come after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. The terror from the Lord. The King James says the fear of the Lord came upon the people and they came to him. That's the sort of ruler and king he was. He commanded so much authority when he began to reign. The Spirit of God was with him and look at him. He said they should come to Samuel and himself. Samuel was the priest. So he was the king. Samuel was the priest and he recognized priesthood. At this time, remember, Samuel was old. So, you know, humble guy, he recognized the authority of God because the priest represented God in those days. So he was ruling and reigning, but always consulting Samuel, the prophet and priest. And, you know, something else about this uh, young man, even as, you see, when they made him king, you know, some people rejected him. You know, have you witnessed anything like You get a promotion at work and people begin to resent you the people who are your friends they don't they are not happy that you've been promoted who knows what we're talking about here you know then you know or all of a sudden they make you the manager and some people will come and congratulate you manager but some people they won't hide it they don't like your face they are not happy you are a manager and on top of that, that means they have to start reporting to you. They don't even hide it. They will show you, we don't want you here. Now, when you become manager, what do you do to such people? And the power is now in your hands. You want to deal with them or post them out or, you know, kind of sack them, get them sacked. Not, not, not so. Not so. The people, when he began to reign and command authority, some people came to him, let's deal with those people who rejected you. Do you know what he said? He said, no, 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 no. We're not going to shed blood. He was compassionate. Even to those people who rejected him. Look, that is the background of this king. Humble background, compassionate, thoughtful, respectful. Now, let's see when he became king, God gave him an instruction. For Samuel chapter 12, from verse 13 to 25. The instruction, this is a summary of the instruction. You can go to the slide now. Because I just want to run a quick commentary before we get to the little foxes that began to affect this great king with such a humble beginning. The summary of all the instructions that God gave was this. God told the children of Israel, because they demanded for the king, God didn't want them to have the king. And God was saying this in the presence of Saul the king and the people. You know, in other words, Saul, it's not my will that you actually should be king. People, it's because you requested. Now, I'm giving you a king. I'm setting him over you, though it's not my perfect will. Now, if you are that king and you hear God saying, let me, let me come to your office, right? You are a manager in the office and you've just been promoted as manager. And then the authorities came and said, you know, actually, you shouldn't be manager. But it's because these people wanted a manager, that's why we made you. But if you want to succeed, 
even though we didn't really with our own uh, volition wanted you. But if you want to succeed, these are the things you should do. Now God begins to tell him, you should have reverence for God. You should fear him. You should serve him faithfully. Summary of the commandments, instructions. God said, hearken to his to my voice. God was telling them, don't rebel against the Lord's commandment. You know, that was just, just, just listen to whatever God says. Uh, King Saul, this is how you will succeed, you and the people. And God gave them a condition. Say, if you do wickedly, you will be swept away. I mean, if you were King Saul at this point in time, how will you begin to conduct yourself? God has told you, you are not really my perfect will for these people, but I want you to succeed. And this is how to succeed. If you are so, what will you do? I mean, common sense should tell you that, yeah, God wants me to succeed, even though God does not want me there. You see, let me tell us something. We can liken this to situations and circumstances in our lives that we are not really in God's perfect will, but in something that, you know, people have coined this. I've done a little bit of study, prayed, meditated over it, that you can actually be not in God's perfect will, but in a permissive will of God. It's not what God wants perfectly for you, but God is still permitting you to be there. And then God, even in his permissive will, for who he is, still wants you to succeed. Is that not a good God? That's one beautiful thing about God. Even though you are not in his perfect will, but he still wants you to succeed in his permissive will. That's the God we're talking about here. And God tells Samuel, I mean Saul, this is what you should do. Then from chapter 13, trouble began. Let's begin to see a king and the little foxes. Fox number one. We see it in 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 1 to 3. This is just a commentary. Look at the first thing he did in verse 1. King Saul, not perfectly in the will of God, but God wants him to succeed. God says, obey me, follow my law, follow my instructions, you will succeed. Look at the first thing he did. He reigned one year. Glory be to God. We didn't hear of any adverse uh, story. We didn't hear of anything he did. Guess what? He reigned two years again. No incidents. And then the third year, King Saul decides to choose 3,000 men of Israel. And then 2,000 were with him in Michmash and in Mount Bethel. And he gave 1,000 to his son, Jonathan. 3,000 men. He decides to choose 3,000. I mean, look at it this way. First year, yeah, he reigned. No problem. Second year, he reigned. No, 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 no. I want some excitement here. No, no, no. I must do something. You know, this, this, so, do you know some people just don't like peace? Some people just don't like it when it's quiet. Do you know the Bible says that it's in stillness and in quietness that we will have strength? That's where our strength will be. Some people just can't stand it when it's still, when it's too quiet for two years. One year, mm, you can go with it. Second year, okay, no, I must do something. He chose 3,000. 2,000 to himself, one third to his son Jonathan. And you know what he went to do? He went to fight. Verse 3. His son, who was given 1,000 people, he went to the Philistines and he fought the Philistines. Do you know the first fox here? Saul began to fight unnecessary battles. Using men. There are some battles some of us might be fighting in our lives that is completely unnecessary. Yes, the Philistines were there. Of course, they don't like the children of Israel. But who told you to choose 3,000 men to go and fight them? If you check the Bible, God never sent him to fight. So he decides to fight. And guess what? His son took the key, went with his 1,000. You know when you have power all of a sudden, you want to flex it. 
So he goes to the Philistines, to one part of the Philistines, and he's, you know, killed people. He smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And guess what? His father was, that's my boy. The Bible said, Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. He went to fight. His son fought. He commended his son. Yeah, that's my boy. You know, everything is so peaceful, but you don't just like peace. Power is in your hands. Do you know, there's a saying that power corrupts. You know, my wife and I were listening to a message yesterday, and (laughs) something we heard is very, very true. Money is like an amplifier. You all can hear me today because there's an amplifier there that is amplifying my voice. If I'm soft-spoken, if I speak into the amplifier, what will you be hearing? An amplified, soft voice, like that of Pastor Deboy. Let somebody shout hallelujah. (laughs) Soft-spoken. If I'm like Prophet Ezekiel, (laughs) come! That's what you will hear. An amplified, uh, you know, money is an amplifier. If you are poor, right? And you are proud. The moment you have money, uh, that your pride will be amplified. Some people are poor. They are forced to be humble. But deep down, they are proud people. Just give them one a few change. You will see how they will begin to manifest. Money is an amplifier. A poor man. Poor! In his poverty. He knows because he's poor, he can't go after girls. Because he's poor, give him a little bit of money. That's when he will know that, I mean, I have to change my status now. This wife I have, I need two or three more. To meet with my status. When he was poor, he didn't think of second wife, third wife. Money has suddenly come and has amplified what was hidden in the heart. We begin to see Saul manifesting. We saw him as a humble. He never wanted to be king. First year, second year is king. Nothing is happening in my kingdom. Third year. Come on, let's use this power. So he went to fight. Do you know what happened afterwards? Trouble began. Look at the Philistines. Let me introduce you to what the Philistines did. Verse 4. Right? All Israel heard that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and Israel was also, you know, Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. Okay? Right? The Philistines didn't like them. The Philistines were dwelling there quietly. He was reigning here. First year, second year, quite, but no, 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 no. Let's go and touch them. Okay, verse 6. Sorry, verse 5. Look at them. The Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. Look at how many they were. 30,000 chariots. Hold on there. How many men did Saul gather? 3,000. 30,000 chariots. 6,000. Thousand horsemen. Excuse me, these chariots were not uh, uh, mechanized. They were driven by men. Six thousand horsemen. Ah! The Bible, I love the Bible. When the Bible can express, it will use sand. And people as the sand, which is in the seashore, in the multitude, they came up. They pitched in Mi'kmaq eastward from Bethavim. Excuse me. Trouble is sleeping. <laughs> ah. Because you have become king, you must look for trouble. Ah? Now that you you have two or three people who are coming to say yes sir, yes sir to you. Now you think you own the whole of the people in your street. You're looking for trouble. 
so they came. Unnecessary battle. The Bible said the people, by the time they dealt with them, right? Look at what happened. I want us to see verse 5. Go to that verse 5. Right? When the men of Israel saw they were in a street, you know when you see that uh, you have beaten more than you can chew? The Bible said they, the people were distressed. They began to hide themselves in caves and in tickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Who caused this? King saw six foot seven inches saw handsome boy, fine boy, no pimples, no freckles, everything in the right place. King of 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 boys. <laughs> Distress. He brought trouble to the camp of Israel, fighting. An unnecessary battle. Are you fighting some unnecessary battle? They, they, they have not touched you. They have not troubled you. But you are looking. You are looking. You are the one looking for trouble. You, 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 you've just married, right? You fine girl. You've just married your husband. Peace, first year, second year, peace. But you know something in your head is telling you some some of your in laws don't like you. On our wedding day, they looked at me somehow. Then you tap your husband in the middle of the night. Do you love me? Do you love me? We must deal. We must deal. We must deal with 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 with, with, with Uncle Zekaya. I remembered on our wedding day. After two years, you just remembered. Looking for trouble. Fighting an unnecessary battle. A king and his foxes. Who sent him to fight? Nobody. Let's see another fox in his life. From that time, he began to mislead the people. He began to mislead the people. Go back to that uh, first Corinthians, uh, I said Corinthians, Samuel chapter 13. Go to verse 7. There's something that I just want us to see here. It began to mislead the people because the people were gathered, right? He gathered them in a, he was in a place called Gilgal. They gathered there. He went to battle. Immediately they saw the enemy, they scattered. But look at what King Saul did. Some of the Hebrews went over the Jordan to the land of God and Gilead as for Saul. Where was he? He was yet in Gilgal. And all the people followed him trembling. The people are scattered. Those who will hide will hide. Those who will go to the cave will cave. Those who will cross, you know, over Jordan will cross. They will scattered. The few people who are still with him. Let's remember, the people who are with him were 2,000. His son had 1,000. Just watch this. And then he went to Gilgal. Just leave it on that scripture, right? He went there to Gilgal. And all the people who went with him were when they are trembling. There's something about that Gilgal. You know, the Gilgal had a little bit of notoriety. But I won't go into that today. But let's look at Gilgal, right? In a prophetic way. Gilgal literally means a circle. A circle. You know, those of us who came for the Bible study two weeks ago, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here looking up to heaven? Right. He led the people right into Gilgal. Prophetic application. He was misleading these people, taking them in circles, making no progress. Misleading people. You know, you can, when you are going around a circle, you have progress, don't you? But are you moving? I am mean, sorry, you have movement, but are you moving? Just go around the circle. You are just going around. Why won't people be trembling? Right? You start, you started misleading people. Took them. They went to Gilgal. Let's see another fox in his life as he began to mislead people. Go to verse 7. In verse 7, uh, sorry, then verse 8, the next verse. He waited there seven 
days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel, the prophet, did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. Please hold it there. He tarried there seven days. There's another prophetic application there. Seven, usually, right? God made the earth six days, seven days rested, right? So that's the completion of a circle. So seven prophetical is usually uh, completion, perfection, right? That was a set time. He waited seven days. Now, Samuel, as a prophet and a priest, represented God. But, he did not come to that place. And guess what? The people who are looking up to him, King, we've been going around this circle, just moving, no progress. You told us, God will come in seven days. Now, where is the God? Does that not speak to us? There are some set times in life that we expect God to move on our behalf. And because God tarries, we lose our impatience. We lose our patience. Let me give you an example. You know, this is very sensitive, but just for the sake of this, just listen to it with a very pure heart. There is a set, there's something called the time of life. Right? If you read the Bible, the time of life means the time a woman conceives and she delivers a baby. How many of us know that set time? How long is it? Nine months. So, nine months, nothing has happened. What are you doing? Usually, women begin to panic. I know this is a very sensitive thing. God has not come at the appointed time. Or some of us, we believe at a certain age, we should be married. At that appointed time, God does not show up. What do you do? Some of us are leading people and you've boasted about your God. Before April 1st, Holy Mount, we will buy it. Completion date. April 1st comes, nothing happens. <laughs> that our pastor. Are we sure? Are we sure? Excuse me, if God tarries, that, mean, that doesn't mean God has forgotten you. God does not count days, time, as we do. The seven days we see in the book of Genesis were not seven chronological days. The Bible tells us one day with the Lord is that what? A thousand years. So if you are here and you've given God a certain time deadline, God, I prayed to you. I fasted. And I told you by the 24th of this month, it must happen. 24th of this month comes and God tarries. What do you do? What do you do? Let's see what Saul did. When you are under pressure, serious pressure, look at the pressure. Please, let, let, let's, let's, please go back again. Go back again. Look, let, let's try and be sympathetic a bit. Do you know the pressure this leader, this king was facing? Pressure of the enemy. Killing his people. Pressure that God, that I called unto, was going to come in seven days. Seven days has come. God didn't appear. Pressure. Pressure. Let's see what he did under pressure. Verse 8. No, verse, verse 8 please. Verse 8. He tarried seven days according to the set time. Samuel had appointed, but Samuel did not come. And the people were scattered from him. 
pressure from the enemy, pressure from God, pressure from the people. PPP, prophet, Philistine, people. Those are usually the pressures of life. There are some things you would not ordinarily do, ordinarily do, but because of pressure that God has not answered your prayer. You've kept your virginity for this long. You are under pressure, under pressure. Somebody finally, finally quarter to go comes. But it gives you, is it a proviso? Is that the right word, lawyer, Ohio? Is it a proviso, a proviso? What's it? Is it a proviso? Please, your lawyer, say, please help me. Provide, proviso. What does a proviso mean? A condition, right? The person now appears, gives you a proviso. I know you've waited all this long. So have I. But I will marry you on one condition. We got to do some test in the bedroom. We got to test if we are compatible. Yeah, physically, emotionally, and sexually. And then we've got to test if I make a deposit. Definitely, there will be a withdrawal. How many of us know I'm speaking parables? You're in the spirit. I don't want my son to know what I'm saying. As if he doesn't know. (laughs) Yeah. I've got to test if you're fertile. So let's go do it. Let's go do it. You've waited. You've promised God I will know. It's on my wedding night. It's on the wedding night. But now I've got to go. It's the only guy. Nobody has ever smiled to you all these years. 40 years, nobody smiled. <laughs> Somebody has now come. <laughs> what will you do under pressure? So let's be a bit sympathetic. Now, what did he do? Pressure from the enemy. The enemy is going to kill, scatter all the people. The people have gone. People have left me. The people I rely so much on are leaving me. Leaving me. All right. So he does something. In verse 9. Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering. Give me the amplified. Because that tells us exactly what he did here. Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered burnt offering, which he was forbidding. A king does not enter into the office of a priest. But under pressure, PPP, people pressure, Philistine pressure, prophet pressure. He goes to do what he shouldn't do. He goes. We all face pressures of life. I won't lie to you. As a pastor, I face pressures. I remembered last year, was it last year or two years ago when we had a, um, a, a retreat? And we invited a man of God who was coming from London. And he tarried. The people were here. Hungry. And I was there. Hungry. And I was wondering. I told people the meeting will start at this time. Now, great man of God is not here. What do we do? I was beginning to think in my head. Let me just go there and begin to prophesy on the people. Let me just go look for one message and just begin to preach as I was beginning to nail down here thinking, okay, let me just look for one message somewhere. God just took me back to the scripture. Right there I was sitting. Ah, you want to enter into an office? I didn't call you at this time. I'm under instruction every time we have retreat. I don't minister. God told me, sit down. It's your own time to learn. So I, I was, I almost fell for the temptation. I said, no, I'm not going. I, do, I don't want to die. I'm not going. Let the people be waiting. Let, let them wait. Under pressure, we do things. He went into the office of a priest, which he shouldn't. He became impatient, under pressure. That was a fox in his life. Impatience. 
he went into an office, a ministry he was not called on to. First Samuel chapter 13. Right? Okay, he does this. But look at the sad thing. Verse 10. Just as he offered the offering, the Bible said it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering for Samuel chapter 13, verse 10, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. At what point did God show up? Just after he disobeyed. Could it be God telling you, 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 you are just so close to your breakthrough. And then that's when you blow it. Don't blow it. Please tell your neighbor, wait. Don't. Don't do it. Don't do it. Under pressure. Child of God, maintain your integrity even under pressure. Just at that point, Samuel showed up. But you know the sad thing about this man that we begin to see in his life in verse 15. Rather than him repenting when Samuel confronted him, the Bible said he went, look at him, Samuel arose. He got him off from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him. How many people? How many did he start with? All together. 3,000. They had whittled down to 600. You have done something you shouldn't do. Why not repent? Go back to God. He went to number the people to go and fight again. To go and fight. Yes, you started the battle. But please repent. You've ignited the fire. Please look for some water. Put it out. Don't say I will give them fire for fire since we have started, you know, fire. It's not wise. It's not wise. Fire for fire is not wise. I I remember that I saw one uh, poster, you know, some funny poster one time. A church was holding a program. Operation fire for fire. Holy Ghost night. Come, come. Special anointing program. Operation Fire for Fire. I saw one post that. Please, pardon my English. It's a little bit broken. It's called Pigeon. I saw the poster. Something, something, Salvation Ministries. Theme of the conference. God, now so we go be. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Now so we go be means God is this how we will be that was the theme of the co- of the conference <laughs> that was the theme <laughs> he got up numbered the people that tells me another fox in his life so much relied on people to go and fight against 600 against 30,000 chariots 6,000 horsemen and people that like sand. You still went. You've not learned your lesson. A king and his foxes. Rather than repent, he went to number the people. 600. 600. 600? Okay. Do you know the sad thing again? The 600 people he went to number were ill-equipped. They didn't have the right weapons of warfare. Their weapons were blunt. Guess where they went to sharpen it? Verse 20. Verse 20. Look at verse 20. But all Israelites went down to Philistines to sharpen every man his shear, his coulter, his axe, his mattock. The same enemies. These enemies are very good enemies, you know. Do you know why you want to fight the devil? Don't use the devil's natural weapons. The devil will give you, will equip you with his weapons if you want to fight him. Because he knows if you use his, the weapons of the enemy to fight the enemy, you can't win. Hey, First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not 
carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down. Learn the principle here. The enemy, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, thank you. The enemy will always equip you to fight him. Because he knows you can't win. So that's why, go and give fire for fire. What do you get when you have fire for fire? More fire. But the Bible tells me that the word of God is like water. The washing of water by the word. Water is the solution to fire. So when the enemy brings fire, go and take fire. Go and look for water. Yeah, but somebody's saying that the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came, tongues as of cloven fire, you know, descended upon them and all that. Excuse me. When Jesus was confronted with the devil, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, the devil came to tempt Jesus. What did Jesus give to the devil? The word, it is written. Child of God, that's what you need. What is written, not fire. You need the word of God to overcome the enemy. Not gimmicks. You see, we are in a time where we, because we are human beings, we are fleshly, we are carnal, we like gimmicks. We like somebody to tell us that if you can roll from that place to that place, roll, roll, and be counting. 40 times. For 40 times, all your enemies, your uncles, your outlaw and in-laws will be smitten for 40 days. How many of us will roll? No, don't answer. Just as you are rolling, be saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. We like all those gimmicks. Excuse me. When the devil came to Jesus, Jesus said, it is written. It is written. How many written things do you know? Probably the only thing you know written is the lyrics of the latest song. That won't defeat the enemy. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. Go and tell the enemy that one. Oh, baby, baby, I love you. I tell you. You are the sweetest pie in my tea, my sugar. That's all the lyrics you know. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. He depended on the people. He depended on the enemy's weapons. Fox. When we go to verse chapter 14, we begin to see from then on, it was terrible. He kept on misleading and misleading the people. He went on and on and on. In chapter 14, we see that God, right, still came. But at that point in time, God had rejected him. Because in chapter 13, Saul told him. Samuel told Saul, God has rejected you. God is a sought for a man after his own heart. David. Do you know the original instruction God gave him? You are not perfect, with, but please, if you follow my commandment, if you follow my instruction, you will succeed. He began to go his own way. So chapter 14 he continued to make rash and rash decisions. God being God. Right? God did something in that chapter 14 that amazed me. If you study it, he remembered God. In verse 18, 1 Samuel chapter 14. He remembered God. Even in the midst of his madness. He told to Ahijah, bring here the ark of God. For that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. He wanted to fight another battle. So he remembered God. So they consulted God. See what happened in verse 19. While Saul talked to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp kept increasing. Then Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Do you know what happened before now? 
his son Jonathan went to fight. Learn a principle. And himself and his servant realized that, hey, we can't fight these people with what we have. But you know what? Let two of us go. Whether God will save us from these people. His son Jonathan relied on God to fight. He didn't go with men. Two of them went. Do you know what happened? They defeated the Philistines. That's where the scripture, very powerful. He said, I doesn't, I'm paraphrasing, it doesn't take God to save whether with a little or multitude. As long as he's with God. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if two of you shall agree. What you just need is two people to agree. Not 1,000 people to agree. In fact, it's difficult to for four people to agree. You know why? Because Jesus always said two or three. All I need is somebody to agree with me. I'm not looking for a crowd. I'm not looking for a crowd. I want to do something and I believe God is asking me to do this. I don't need a crowd. You know, the crowd, the crowd effect. The crowd will always, usually, I am telling you, where you see crowd, if there is no proper leader, the crowd will always go in the wrong direction. The Bible says don't follow a multitude to do evil. The Bible says why is that way? That leads to destruction. And there are many. But the one that leads to life, few. I don't need a crowd. His son went, showed him a principle. First Samuel chapter 14, 6 to 16, that's where the story is. Two of them, just him and his servant, they defeated the Philistines. So, when Saul, he was there, right? And he, he remembered God. And he consulted God. He said, bring me the ark. This is what happened. And all of a sudden, he saw that, hey, what's happening in the camp of the Philistines? They have been defeated. That was Jonathan and his servant at work, defeating, and they saw the Philistines running away. He was consulting God. What did he tell the priest to do? Please go back to that verse. Verse 19. What did he say? Withdraw your hand. Withdraw. I don't need you again. But he didn't know how Jonathan did it. He began to make rash decisions. At some point, he led the people to fight again. And he told them, nobody must eat. If anybody eats, I will curse all of you. A king begins to misuse his... You know, when you're in a position of authority, you can get intoxicated. Not not with liquor, but with power. He said, nobody... It it took them to fight that battle. He said, cursed be the person who eats. He put them on a... He cursed the people he was leading. So you know what? Of course, Jonathan had gone in the power of God. So all these people went to fight. So they were fighting. They didn't know it was God in the midst of the battle. So after all the battles and the fought, the people were very hungry. And you now told them, okay, now you can eat. When you are hungry, you eat anything. The Bible says that a full soul in the book of Proverbs, right? I'm paraphrasing. You know, when you are full, there's no food, no matter how delicious it is, that will entice you. Unless you're a glutton. Even if you're a glutton, your stomach has capacity. It's got capacity. I'm still remembering what you said yesterday and I'm laughing. I'm laughing now. So <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Let me tell them. <laughs> you know, yesterday we were discussing and uh, just talking. So he saw somebody, somebody blessed me with food. He said, wow, it's good to be a pastor. It's good to be a pastor because he saw somebody give me food. So I said, uh, Gerard, can you drink the cup? Do you know what it? Do you know the price to pay for this? Can you drink the cup? He said, you know what? <laughs> I, I don't need to drink the cup. I can eat the food. <laughs> <laughs> no cup, but food. He wants food. <laughs> He told his people, 
They must not eat. So he let them fight with an empty stomach. They were fainting. The Bible says a full soul will loathe honey. You will see honey. Honey will, you, you, you will despise it because you are full. He said, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So these people, the spoils of the Philistines, they just descended on it. They began to eat. Ah, cattle, they would not. Ah. And guess what? They ate blood, which was forbidden. They ate blood. Forbidden. Now, who is to blame? Do you know what Saul did when, was, when, he, when they, they came to him? They told him, Ah, the people have eaten blood. Saul, the people have eaten blood. The people have eaten blood. Verse 32. Sorry, verse 22. Let me see. Just, I just want us to see something about this king. When they came to him. Come, come, come. Go to verse 32. Of First Corinthians chapter. Uh, sorry, First Samuel. Chapter 14. They came to him, right? Verse 32. First Samuel 14, 32. Just listen to this story. When night came, the oath expired. Because he made them swear an oath that they would not eat. Compulsory fasting. The men flew upon the spoil. They took sheep, ha, oxen, cows. They slew them to the ground. Hey, this is barbecue. And they ate them raw with the blood. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? Okay, verse 33. Then Saul was told. Behold, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating the blood. And he said, look at what he said. You have all transgressed. All of you. It's you that transgressed. Who made them transgress? A leader. The buck should stop with a leader. You don't pass the buck. All of you. You now became the judge. All of, all of you. Like, you know, the scouts are say. All you. At all you sinners looking at me, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at them. They have eaten blood. He now became all of a sudden a judge. You misled the people. Never, fox, another fox in his life, never accepting responsibility for his sins. You will see this trend in his life. You will always see this trend in the life of Saul. See, let me let me begin to close a bit because we are looking at a king and the foxes. First Samuel chapter fifteen. We get to First Samuel chapter fifteen, and God gives him a second chance. Oh, please, somebody say God is good. God comes to him. First Samuel chapter fifteen, verse one. Okay, you know what, Sam, uh, Saul, come, come, come. The Amalekites, right? Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you. King, verse 1, verse 1, please. King over these people, Israel. Now listen, listen. Heed to the words of the Lord. He's messed up, quite all right. He's made people transgress. He's made rash decisions. He's fought unnecessary battles. And God now comes to him. Okay. God is reminding him how he got there. Anointed you. Now listen. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I have considered and will punish what Amalek did to Israel. How he set himself against him in the way when Israel came out of Egypt. God is a God of vengeance. Please, somebody listening to this. Let God avenge you. Don't try to fight for yourself. God has not forgotten. People have wronged you. Somebody is here, you are cooking up and planning to revenge big time. Thus says the Lord, vengeance is mine. Drop your vengeance and I will avenge for you. God remembers what Amalek did when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. Amalek came and attacked the weak ones. Please don't touch God's people. Because you would not get away with it. The Bible says, touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. I know 
that scripture has been baptized, uh, bastardized. Do you know who is the Lord's anointed? You think it's only men of God? Okay, if men of God are the Lord's anointed, who are you? The devil's anointed. You are the, please lift up your hands and thank God you are the Lord's anointed. Anybody should not touch you. Please know that today. You are the Lord's anointed and it is written, touch not my anointed to my prophets. No harm. Fear has just left somebody now. Fear, fear. That has destroyed the spirit of fear tormenting you. I'm telling you, nobody can touch you. Your life is hidden in Christ and Christ is God. Fear not, child of God. Now listen. God now says, all right, I'm going to deal with them. You know what? You go. In verse 3, look at God's instruction. Go and smite the Amalek. Utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them. But kill. God was so specific. Both men, women, infant, babies, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey, verse 4. So Saul assembled the men. Look at the next thing he does again. There's something about this guy, man. Always relying on men. Always remember, the first, he will always number people. How many people do I have? How much do we have? God is giving you a project to do. How much do I have? No, I'm not saying that you should not be prudent. I'm not saying that, you know, Jesus said you want to build a tower. Sit down, count the cost, right? So that you don't start something, you don't finish. Can I tell you the currency you need with God? It's called faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. How does faith come? Hearing the word of God, that's all you need. As God said it, hold it. Just hold dearly to it. And at every point of challenge, remind God, God, you are not a man. You cannot lie. This is what you said. God responds to faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's the currency you need. And you will see one step after the other, God will begin to give you direction. That's faith. The next thing, numbers the people. Goes to number. 200,000. So Saul came to the city of Amalek. He laid wait in the valley. Okay, you know the rest of the story. He went there. Yeah. They struck Amalek big time. They destroyed everything and then they decided to take the king and then they looked at all the good oxen the beautiful looking camels the bible said they looked at they took all that was good and left the vile hey listen to me that it is good that not does not necessarily mean it is God. Don't judge by good. Hey, he looks good. He talks good. But is he of God? She smells good. She walks good. She comes from a good home. So did the sons of Samuel and Eli. They came from good homes. He spears the king. He spears the sheep. He spears the best. He spears everything he saw that was good. That was the last straw. God came through Samuel again and told him, what is this thing I'm hearing? Do you know what he said? Do you know what he said? He said it's the people who speared the sheep. They saved it. And guess what? To make sacrifice to the Lord your God. That's what he told someone. To judge your God that sent you. He want to offer both of it to you. What are you talking? You know, let, let, let me show us exactly where he said it. You know, this thing blew my mind. Go to verse, verse 8 and 9. 
right? Verse 8 and 9. And then, okay, let's go to verse 13. From verse 13. Right? Verse 13. Samuel came to Saul and said, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed what the Lord ordered. Immediately the prophet came to him. I've done it. Glory to God. He came to give testimony. (laughs) Testimony of half obedience. Incomplete obedience. You know some of us, God help you. Right? That you don't come and give testimony. Right? And you are the one taking the glory. I have what? Performed. What the Lord ordered. Verse 14. Someone said, what then means this bleating of sheep in my ears? The lowing of the oxen which are here? Here is defense. Never accepting responsibility for his action. So said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spear the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. <laughs> but the rest we have ah, we, we destroyed them. But to the Lord, that God that sent you, in case you don't know how to serve him, that's why we, 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 we did this. How many of us like, are like that? Some years ago, I was in an ungodly relationship. I knew I shouldn't be in this relationship. And I began to pray to God. God, I want to marry her. God, please. If I marry her, I will take good care of her. God, please. What God has joined, join me together. We will marry. God said no. But God, you are the one who said it's not good for the man to be alone. It's not good. But excuse me. If it's not God, it is not God. Don't try and negotiate with God. Don't try and do mathematics with God. I learned that from a sister in this church. If you want to pay your tithe, pay your tithe. It's called one tenth. Don't do mathematics. God, you know, let's give to Caesar. What is Caesar? Okay? So out of the one, let's make one tenth. This morning, God, I worked for it. Right? And I had planned to use it to buy Porsche. So, this one, Lord, you know, let's put this aside. Now, the rest, I will tithe to you. You said, uh, bring tithe. So, you are doing maths with God. God doesn't know maths. We've come to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Did you see him taking responsibility here? No, they. It's always the people. You know the sad thing? And I will close with this. The prophet told him. I'm paraphrasing. God has rejected you. What will you do if you are so beg, right? He begged. He begged. Oh, please. Oh, no, no. God shouldn't reject me. God shouldn't reject me. And I was wondering why God didn't forgive him until I saw something. Let me show you what I saw by the Spirit of God. You know, we can't fool God. We cannot, listen to me, fool God in any way. In verse 20, Saul was justifying his disobedience. Yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, right? And I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21. Look at what he said. But the people took from the spoil sheep, oxen, chief of the things to be utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. I mean, it's the people. I did everything, but the people are the ones who did this. Who led the people? When they took it, why didn't you tell them to drop it? Are you not the leader? Now, let's go down to what verse is that? Go to verse 24. Go to verse 24. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words because 
I fear the people and obey their voice. If not for these foolish people, I wouldn't have done it. If not, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, brother Zacchaeus. It was brother Zacchaeus. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. God, you say, I, you know, you see my heart. I didn't want to do it. If not for Zacchaeus, he came to my house 2 a.m. in the morning. He told me he wanted to do revision in geography. <laughs> At 2 a.m. in the morning, you are a fool. Revision at 2 a.m. To revise. What are you revising? Do you know a soft one? Ah, I just had a dream. I had a dream. Let's do Bible study. 2 a.m. in the morning. In your house. Why did you come to vigil in church? I've transgressed. Still pushed it onto the people. Does that not sound like Adam? It's the woman you gave me. I didn't want to eat. I did not want. You told me not to eat. I've obeyed you until you brought that woman into my life. <laughs> Never accepting responsibility for his actions. Never. He, would, he just begged to be forgiven. Some of us are like that. God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I wouldn't have done it if not for that stupid, stupid friend. Those stupid, like a friend, you know. Okay, he's a friend. Don't let me deny him. He came to me one day. <laughs> I don't know why I'm always fornicating. <laughs> I don't know. But I notice every time I enter that boy's car, that boy's car, something just comes over me. I just notice I enter his car. I enter his car. Something comes. What's that something? You enter. So, is the car. Can you see how we, re, how we repent and deceive ourselves? If you want to repent, repent. God, I've done it. I'm sorry. Help me. End of story. Don't give reasons. Don't come and begin to justify your sin before God. Because I feared the people. And I obeyed their voice. Verse 27. See what happened. The Bible said, And I saw turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his mantle. This is Samuel who doesn't want to drink up but eat food. It's okay. <laughs> He has delivered the Lord's message. The guy was begging. It's the people, it's the people, it's the people. So the guy turned to go. He just tore. <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, it was a prophetic act. You know, prophets, the same way you have torn this cloth, so God has torn the kingdom from you. Let's bow our heads to pray. Please, if you want to repent, repent. Foxes, there are foxes. They are little, they destroy vines. Foxes, stubbornness, rebellion, the Bible says. God said, it's like witchcraft. You are rebelling and you know, you know. You know, once you've been told, twice you've heard, but you are still continuing. The Bible says it's like witchcraft. Stubbornness. It's like iniquity. Idolatry. Obedience. It's better than sacrifice. God help us. God help me. God help me. God help me. God help me. This is a timely message for some people. This is a timely message for all of us. This might be your last, last, last. Just like King Saul, God is giving you a second chance and the last Second 
and the last. Are you going to continue in your rebellion, in your witchcraft, in your stubbornness, in your iniquity, in your idolatry? Hear the word of the Lord. There is no human being you cannot do without. It's only God you cannot do without. Have you not seen people who get married? Wife dies. Life continues. Husband dies. Widow continues. With How much? That Those are people in the covenant. Life goes on. It goes on. If any human being is telling you without them, you are nothing. Child of God, listen to this. That has become an idol in your heart. There's nobody you cannot do without. If friends are causing you to sin, and that's always your excuse, you are not different from King Saul. When would you accept responsibility, full responsibility without passing the book? How long will you start? Bl- will you continue to blame your husband? How long will you continue to blame your wife? How long will you continue to blame your father, who is even dead? If not for my father, this and this and this, brethren. There is a call, and what I'm hearing in my spirit, this is a final call for some people. final call final final call if God is God, serve him if the things unconsciously that have become gods to you is God if they are the ones that created you then serve them what I sense in my spirit final call final call a final call. Let me encourage you. Repent. 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 Cry out to the Lord in your heart. God is good. Make no mistake about that. In the midst of his permissive will, can still be blessing you but that doesn't mean he approves of you Lord have mercy on all of us including myself are there areas in my life you are only permitting me to continue but it's not your will for me open my eyes to see these foxes the fox of permissive will and thinking because I'm still going out and coming in you approve of what I'm doing Lord, have mercy. Please, let's talk to the Lord. Let's talk to the Lord. Let us talk to him. Let us talk to him. Father, help me. 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 It's not about how many times you have responded to a call, an altar call. No, no, no. You might still be holding on and pleading for God's mercy because of people. People. Saul eventually said, look, please, don't don't let me be put to shame before the elders of the people, before the children of people restore my honor. That's all Saul thought about. People, people, people. The fox of people. The fox of what people will say or think. Child of God. Child of God. Child of God. Please get on that keyboard. Get on that keyboard. I just want to do something symbolic right now. God wants to welcome some people home. And when I say home, I'm not talking about you transiting from this world. But transiting from a life of iniquity towards life 
full of peace, righteousness, come into the kingdom. Please, Sapphire, can you sing that song? Come to the river of life. Come and drink freely, freely.